We start unit two by looking at types of chemical bonds. Now the first type of bond I have up here is called a covalent bond. And this is what you have generally speaking when two nonmetals, that is two elements generally speaking from the, the right side of the periodic table are sharing electrons. So here we have an example of this. We have uh, iodine and it's uh, seven valence electrons and we have chlorine over here with its seven valence electrons. And, you know, as we've learned in previous lessons, each of these atoms would really be more stable having eight valence electrons, having that nice stable octet. Well, what they can do is they can get together like this, and they can take this electron right here and that electron right there and share them in the middle. That way, both of these atoms can lay claim to both of those valence electrons in the middle. So we have a shared electron pair. And this is a good example of a covalent bond, two nonmetals sharing a pair of electrons. Now, when we think about the energy behind this, when you have two atoms, like in this top example, that are fairly far apart and they really haven't gotten a chance to share their electrons yet, we'll say that those two atoms have a higher potential energy state. In other words, we can say that they have a high potential to get together and form a bond. Over here though, in this state, we have a lower potential energy state. And normally, whenever you have two uh, atoms that are forming a chemical bond, that distance between them is going to be the lowest potential energy state that is available. We'll talk more about that in a future lesson in this course. But for right now, we can say that when these atoms are far apart and they're not bonding, they have a higher potential energy. When they're closer together and they are bonding, they have that lower potential energy state. And whenever we draw this structure, we take that shared pair that's in the middle and we replace it with a line. That line represents the fact that we have a covalent chemical bond there. So when you see that line, or sometimes uh, two lines, that would mean a double bond, or three lines, right like in that same spot would be a triple bond. We'll see some examples of that here shortly. So if we have a chemical bond like this, that's what we call a nonpolar covalent bond. When you have iodine and sulfur bonding, these two electrons, uh, it's a bond where we have the two nonmetals and they're sharing electrons equally or almost equally. And we have a lot of uh, chemical bonds that do that. On the other hand, we have some pairs of nonmetals like carbon and fluorine where they're not sharing very equally. In fact, they're sharing rather unequally. Uh, one of the atoms is hogging the electron. So the way I, I sometimes think about this is in this first example, you have two nonmetals and they're sharing those electrons equally. They're really good at sharing. So, you know, they're sharing and sharing is a good thing. So they're, you know, they're happy. They're, they're like little angels there, got the little halo there. And so they're good at sharing. They're sharing pretty much equally. There are some people that are like that. They're very good at sharing. On the other hand, we have this set down here, you know, where fluorine is basically hogging the electrons and poor old carbon hardly, hardly gets to use those electrons. Whereas up here, it's pretty much a 50-50 split. Maybe 60-40, but it is pretty close to even. Now, because of the fact that fluorine is hogging the electrons, well, carbon is sad because it doesn't get to use the electrons. It thought it was gonna be sharing. Whereas fluorine, well, it is, I'm not much of, I'm not very good at drawing these hogs here, but you can imagine we have some kind of electron hog here. And that's kind of what's going on. So fluorine is hogging the electrons. That's what happens in a polar covalent bond. One of the atoms is hogging the electrons. Now, the question is, how do I know? How do I know that fluorine is the electron hog and it's not carbon? Or how do I know that in this pair up here, iodine and sulfur are sharing those electrons fairly equally? Well, it comes down to something that we learned at the end of unit one. 
and that's called the electronegativity. Now every atom on the periodic table has an electronegativity. Since we're talking about covalent uh, bonds, I'm just showing you the examples of the electronegativities of the nonmetals here, or most of the nonmetals. But if you look at the difference in the electronegativity of the atoms that are in the, in the structure, you can see if it's a polar or a nonpolar bond. So in that other example, let me just pull that up here, we had iodine and sulfur. So if we look at iodine, its, its electronegativity is about 2.5. Sulfur is 2.5. So they're the same. So that is pretty much a perfectly nonpolar chemical bond. Those two atoms are sharing those electrons equally, 50-50 sharing. If you have a pair of atoms where the difference is less than about 0.5 or so, we can call that nonpolar covalent. Now, it might be the fact that the one that the, with the higher electronegativity is hogging them just a little bit, but there's a continuum here. So as long as the difference is less than about 0.5, we'll go ahead and call it nonpolar covalent. If that difference in the two atoms' electronegativity is 0.5 or greater, we'll call it polar covalent. And of course, the one that has the higher electronegativity is the one that's hogging those electrons a little bit more. And as a result, on the side of that atom, whichever one it might be, whichever one has the higher electronegativity, there's a slight, slight negative charge, a partial negative charge on that part of the bond. The other one that's not hogging those electrons, one with the lower electronegativity, would have a slightly uh, partial positive charge there in that part of the bond. If you ever see a pair of atoms that's a metal and a nonmetal, you know, one from the left side, one from the right side, that's going to be an ionic chemical bond. Now, let's try some examples here. Let's try boron and chlorine. So we can look at the table here. Boron is a 2.0. Chlorine is a 3.0. So that difference between the two is 1.0. So it's certainly greater than 0.5. So it's going to be a polar covalent bond. And chlorine is the one that's hogging the electrons a little bit more, since it's more electronegative. How about carbon and hydrogen? Well, we can look at the chart. Carbon is 2.5. Hydrogen is 2.1. So the difference between those two is 0.4. And that's less than 0.5, isn't it? So we can call that nonpolar covalent. Now, it's not perfectly nonpolar, is it? We know that you know the, the carbon has a little bit higher electronegativity, so it's, it may be hogging those electrons just a little bit, but not a lot. It might be a 60-40 sharing arrangement instead of a perfect 50-50. Now, how about sodium and bromine? Well, notice that sodium is not on the chart at all because sodium is a metal. You can see that on your copy of the periodic table. So this is a metal and a nonmetal. So we're going to call that ionic. And in ionic chemical bonds, the metal is generally transferring those electrons to the nonmetal. Now we're going to take a look at another kind of bonding, and this is called metallic bonding. And this is what you have when you have a metal. Uh, like a chunk of iron, or a chunk of gold, or an alloy, perhaps, of uh, bronze or uh, steel or something like that. Now, in these metallic elements, the, in these metals, electrons have quite a bit of freedom of motion. They're able to move fairly freely instead of being stuck to the nucleus from which they came. So here's an example of that. Here's what you might have in the case of a metal or perhaps an alloy of some sort. We have these metallic nuclei and they're, they're pretty much fixed in place, although metals are fairly malleable and ductile, but for the most part they're solids and they're, they're pretty much in their position. But the electrons are essentially able to move around. They're what we might call a bit delocalized. And so they're able to move around and flow and that actually explains why metals and metallic alloys as well are so good at conducting electricity. Because electricity is the movement of electrons through a wire, basically. 
And so if to have electricity, you have to have these electrons that are able to move around freely, and that's how that works. So this brings us to the end of Lesson 2, Section 1. Hope you liked the video. Join me again in my next video for Section 2.